Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. Uncle Tom's Cabin. By Harriet Beecher Stowe. Published in 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin tells the story of an African American school teacher and her family. Instantly a hit, the book went on to become the best selling book of the whole 19th century. The abolitionist movement and the American Civil War, which began nine years later, both owe their existence to this event. When Stowe met then President Lincoln, he referred to her as the little lady that started this great war, a popular myth. There have been several stage productions, motion pictures, and even comic books based on the novel. Two slaves, Eliza and Tom, are depicted in the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Eliza realizes that Tom and her own kid, Harry, will be sold to a nasty, vicious man named Mr. Haley at the beginning of the novel. She tells Tom about it and he refuses to go, so Eliza walks away with her son, narrowly escaping capture by fleeing through the Ohio River ice flows in the night. During this time, Tom is sold to Mr. Haley, who then sells him to a guy named St. Clair and his adorable daughter Eva, who is the daughter of an angel. Tom and Eva form a close friendship because of their common faith. Eva, on the other hand, falls ill and eventually dies. When Tom's father dies not long after, he is sold to Legree, a nasty owner who often whips him. George, the small son of Tom's first master who promised to track down and rescue his father throughout the years, has now grown into an adult. Tom is dying after a brutal beating by Legree when he arrives. After the death of his friend, George returns to Kentucky to bury him. It turns out that Cassie is Eliza's long-lost mother, a slave who escaped from Legree's plantation as he was on his way back home. The two also run into another woman, who turns out to be Eliza's late husband's sister, who married Eliza's master, got wealthy, and recently divorced him. During their trip to Canada, the gang meets Eliza and her husband, George and they spend some time together before heading to Liberia, a country in Africa dedicated to freeing slaves. Freeing the slaves, Master George tells them to remember Uncle Tom and express their gratitude for their freedom. A chilly February afternoon on a farm in Kentucky serves as the setting for the beginning of the story. Two white men sip wine as they debate a business deal in the middle of the 19th century. Arthur Shelby, a farmer who has run into financial difficulties, has agreed to sell some of his slaves to Mr. Haley a cruel and vulgar man. In order for Mr. Shelby to avoid losing everything he has, he needs to make some money now. One of Shelby's slaves, a man named Uncle Tom, is hard-working, honest, and a devout Christian, he tells Haley. Haley, on the other hand, is insistent on more. Despite her hesitation at first, Shelby decides to trade Harry, the son of Eliza, Mrs. Shelby's maid, for a little boy. Eliza asks Mrs. Shelby if Mr. Shelby is going to sell her son as they are chatting in the other room. Despite her husband's deal, Mrs. Shelby assures Eliza that her boy will be secure. Next, we'll learn more about Eliza's backstory. While she was a stunning young lady married to a gifted half-black guy named George, he had been absent from her life ever since he was employed to work in a neighboring factory. As a manufacturing worker, George devised a machine to speed up hemp cleaning and gain the respect of his boss who was a big fan of his work. George's boss, on the other hand, interpreted this as an attempt by George to avoid working as hard and instead assigned him to menial tasks. Eliza now only sees her husband on rare occasions. Eliza is fiercely protective of Harry, her last remaining child, as a result of the deaths of her two other children. When George sees Eliza in the next chapter, he lets her know he's making plans to flee. He claims that he can no longer stand the drudgery of his work and that his owner has been attempting to get him to marry another woman because his marriage to Eliza is not regarded legally binding because it is between two slaves. Eliza is surprised, but she encourages him to put his faith in God and be patient. As soon as he arrives in Canada in one week, he will begin his efforts to secure the release of her and Harry. A log cottage on Mr. Shelby's property is home to Uncle Tom. The next chapter takes place at his cabin, where his wife, Aunt Chloe, is busy preparing dinner for the two of us. Tom is being tutored by Shelby's son, Master George, as he learns to write letters. Shelby offers to sell Tom and Harry in the main house. Haley pays down his mortgage as soon as he signs the paperwork. In an attempt to persuade Haley to only sell Tom to the nicest of masters, Shelby finally gets her wish. A distraught Mrs. Shelby reminds her husband that he had pledged to release Tom and that she had promised Eliza they would not sell Harry. If they didn't get rid of those two slaves, they had to get go of the rest of the property, according to Shelby. Throughout the film, Mrs. Shelby screams that slavery is a sin and wishes she could do something about it. 
Her husband tells her that the papers have already been signed, so she can't sell her watch to save Harry. Eliza is listening in on the couple's talk, but they aren't aware of it. She rushes to Uncle Tom's cabin with her son and tells him what she's learned from him. Tom claims he has no desire to flee, but Eliza insists that she must. When Eliza tells Tom and Chloe that she's going to Canada, she wants them to tell her husband. She leaves that night with her toddler in tow. When Mrs. Shelby wakes up the next morning and realizes Eliza has escaped, she expresses her gratitude to God for keeping Eliza and Harry together. Although he's scared that Mr. Haley will think he's trying to back out of their agreement, Mr. Shelby insists. When Haley gets back the next morning to pick up his belongings, he is enraged to learn that Harry has vanished without warning. Shelby has instructed his slaves to prepare a horse for Haley so that he can ride out in pursuit of Eliza. A beech nut is hidden under the horse's saddle to annoy it and slow it down as much as possible by the slaves. Mrs. Shelby assigns one of the slaves, Sam, to accompany Haley on her journey. She tells the two to slow down because the horses, one of them was previously lame, will struggle. He Haley up onto his horse, and it bucks him, sending him tumbling to the ground, because of the beech nut. Delaying Eliza's capture by even more time is a result of the havoc this produces. Mrs. Shelby insists that Mr. Haley eat lunch with her and the horses before they go out again. It is revealed in the next chapter that Eliza escaped from the farm the night before. As a mother, she feels isolated and afraid, but she is bolstered by the need to protect her child. In the middle of the night, the two make their way to the Ohio River, which is partially covered in spring ice. Ferry services have been suspended due to ice. There may be a train later that night, so Eliza takes a room at the inn for Harry to sleep. However, she refuses to sleep and instead gazes out at the river, wishing the ice would melt. Aunt Chloe takes her time preparing lunch on the following day in an effort to thwart the thief's plans. Haley is escorted out of the property by Sam and a younger slave named Andy after a long day of searching. They manipulate Haley into taking a course that they know Eliza would never have taken. Sam observes Eliza through the window of the inn as the gang arrives at the Ohio River. Erasing their cover by yelling and pretending to be hit by an oncoming wind, he alerts Eliza to their existence. Eager to escape, Eliza grabs Harry and decides to cross the river on her own. She makes her way over the ice by hopping from one chunk to the next. On the other side, a man assists her in getting back to standing. Ezra recognizes him as a farm owner and neighbor of Mr. Shelby. In order to help Eliza, Mr. Sims tells her of another residence that will provide her with sanctuary. The innkeepers can see Eliza across the river, but Haley can't keep up with the perilous track she's taking on the ice. The tavern is where he must return, and there he meets Tom Loker, a professional slave catcher. Loker and Marks are hired by Haley to find and apprehend Eliza and Harry. After catching Eliza, Loker suggests that they can retain her provided they return Harry to Haley. Haley is on board. Sam and Andy return to the Shelby property, unaware of their deal. Snuggling up to the fire with his wife in their Ohio home, Senator Byrd is watching the snow fall across the river. The Ohio Senate enacted a provision that punishes anyone who aids a runaway slave, and he says he voted for it. When her husband shows up at her door, his wife chastises him, claiming that the law is repugnant and asking him whether or not he would refuse to help a helpless runaway slave. Eliza and Harry do indeed show up to the Bird's house at precisely that same moment. However, Senator Bird and his wife allowed them into their home, although the senator is aware that he will not be able to keep them there permanently. A former slave owner named John Van Tromp, who emancipated his slaves and relocated into a house in the woods, has a safe haven for them, which he takes the gang to. For Eliza's sake, the senator hands John a $10 bill. Tom will be waiting for Haley at the property. Aunt Chloe makes Tom one more lunch before he departs, her sadness evident in her words. According to Tom, their boss is an honorable man. Haley then removes Tom from the situation. They run meet young Master George on the way to his farm, who is astonished and terrified to learn that Tom has been sold. As soon as Haley is out of earshot, Master George promises Tom that he will come to his rescue when he is older. To say his goodbyes, Master George can only give Tom a $1. The spouse of Eliza manages to escape his captor and goes to Canada by pretending to be a Spaniard. On a ship bound for Mississippi, Haley buys a few more slaves and brings them on board. Tom hears a splash as a slave woman who had her son taken from her jumps overboard. A Quaker settlement is where Eliza and Harry will be staying with Rachel Halliday. When George arrives to the community, they are reunited at the same time. Tom behaves obediently and meekly on the road to Mississippi in order to win the admiration of his master.
he encounters Eva St. Clair, a white girl, while reading the Bible one day. It doesn't take her long to warm up to Tom and inform him that she plans to ask her father Augustine if she can ask her father to help her acquire Tom. Eva falls off the boat one day and hurts her back. Tom is able to save her due to his quick thinking. To show his gratitude, Augustine agrees to purchase Tom and signs the bill of sale immediately. Tom is hired as a driver for the St. Clair family. As soon as he sees Eva, he can't help but fall head over heels for her. Tom, on the other hand, is shocked to hear that Augustine is married to a nasty, snobbish woman named Marie, who is out to destroy the slaves. Eliza and George learn at the Quaker camp that Tom Loker and his gang are close by and intend to come for them at night to avenge their parents' deaths. They make their way into the woods and establish a camp in a well-hidden location. When Tom Loker and his men arrive to take them away, George is shot at as he attempts to speak gently to them. In the midst of a gunfight, Loker just misses George and his men, and threatens to shoot anyone who tries to seize them. George shoots Loker and the rest of the slave hunters flee, leaving George alone. The Quakers, moved by Eliza's compassion for Loker, agree to house him till he recovers. At the St. Clair house, Tom is given more and more responsibility. He gradually assumes control of the household's financial affairs. Because of his strong Christian beliefs, he is constantly working to bring about change in both his family and his hard partying, alcoholic father. Augustine agrees to make an effort to change his ways. Augustine does not necessarily favor slavery, but he does not oppose it since he does not understand the point. Despite Tom's efforts, he is unable to compose a letter to his wife and children because of his lack of literacy. They draft a letter jointly after Eva agrees to help. Aunt Chloe is overjoyed when she receives a letter from her husband in Kentucky. As the business of Mr. Shelby continues to falter, he and his wife, Mrs. Shelby, are frequently at loggerheads. As a side business, Chloe offers to Mrs. Shelby that she may make cakes and pies for people. As far as I know, she's on board with my thoughts. Tom has been serving the St. Clairs for two years. He receives a letter from Master George, who informs him of his studies. In the course of their friendship, Tom and Eva form a strong bond based on their Christian beliefs. However, Eva falls ill, and Tom gets concerned for her welfare. Her child is dying, and Marie, who had never shown any concern in her child before, begins to wailing in motherly anguish. A dying Eva begs her father to try and free the slaves as she would have done, had she had the chance. Tom will be freed if she dies, Augustine vows. Thereupon, Eva requests to have piece of her hair clipped off and delivered to the slave owners so they can remember her by. It is her desire to see everyone and to encourage them to be good Christians after she has gone. The house goes into sorrow soon after Eva's death. This makes Marie even more difficult and Augustine refuses to communicate with her as he mourns the loss of his wife. He confesses to Tom that he yearns to believe in God but has never done so. When he prays, he claims that he feels alone and unheard. His faith is awakened by Augustine's sermon. Augustine is stabbed in the back while attempting to break up a brawl between two inebriated men shortly after that. Tom prays for him while he succumbs to his injuries at home. It was too late for him to fulfill Augustine's vow to his daughter that he would liberate Tom when she died, because his death came so suddenly. As a result, all of Marie's slaves are now hers. Instead of liberating the slaves, the nasty woman chooses to sell them all. Slave auctioneer Simon Legree buys Tom for a pittance after finding him in a slave warehouse. Legree's cotton plantation is on the horizon for Tom and a slave girl named Emily. Although he does not find the Bible hidden in Tom's shirt, Legree tells Tom that there is no religion on his property and takes away his hymn book. With the exception of his slaves, Legree is the sole occupant of his property. Emmeline, a slave woman who formerly shared his chambers with him, has been purchased to replace Cassie. Even the slaves are brutal to one another on the estate, which turns out to be a horrific place. Tom's faith begins to waver, but when he gets a vision of Eva, he is inspired to continue on. He makes an effort to assist his fellow slaves whenever he has the opportunity. Tom helps Cassie out in the fields one day. To punish Cassie for her collaboration, Legree has Tom lash her. The two Legree overseers pull Tom outdoors and severely beat him when he resists. Cassie visits Tom after he has been beaten and tries to heal him. That she doesn't believe in God, and that she's given up hope for the future of the two of them. He exhorts her not to let the evil deeds of others to shake her faith. During the conversation, Cassie reveals to him that she is half white and was raised by a wealthy white man. When she was finally caught, she was living with an attorney's wife and their children. However, the lawyer then changed his mind and sold her and her children to someone else. 
he sold her children, and she had another child with a different man, to someone else. According to her, when this child was a newborn, she poisoned it to keep it from being given up. After then, she was traded from peddler to peddler until she arrived at Legree's hands. Tom is summoned by Legree the following day, and he commands him to beg for pardon. But Tom is adamant that Legree cannot harm him because all he has to look forward to is an eternal vision in his mind. While Loker tends to the first group, George and Eliza make it to another Quaker settlement safely. After his recovery, Tom makes the decision to remain a member of the Quakers in order to live a new, moral life. Eventually, George and Eliza make it to Canada. In order to get out of Legree, Cassie and Emmeline must convince the estate's occupants that a ghost is trapped in the attic. When no one is looking, they sneak up the stairs and into the attic. Anyone who hears noises in the attic will assume it is the ghost and run for cover, so the two women can stay there for a little longer. Tom is once again beaten by Legree, who lashes out at him for their escape. After a while, he tells his two overseers to beat Tom. Tom continues to pray for the salvation of the overseers' hearts. George, now a grown man, arrives up at the Legree plantation a few days later in search of Tom. After the death of his father, Mr. Shelby, he has been looking for Tom for years. Despite the fact that George has found Tom in a critical condition, Tom is overjoyed to see him. Shortly later, he passes away peacefully. Taking the body of Tom, George intends to have Legree charged with murder. As Legree points out, there are no witnesses because no whites were present. George is enraged by this, and he attacks Legree, knocking him to the ground. In his absence, other slaves implore him to acquire them. It is his goal to end slavery as soon as possible. Cassie assumes the identity of a Spaniard and, along with Emmeline, flees the plantation by boat, where they meet George. She tells him everything, fearing that he sees through her disguise after he notices her. George promises to do everything he can to keep her safe. Madame de Tu, a French woman on the boat, inquires about George's hometown. She has little trouble figuring out that Eliza's husband, George Harris, is actually her older brother. As her brother was a slave, she tells George Shelby she was sold to a nice man, who subsequently married her and moved her to the West Indies. He recently passed away and left her a large sum of money. Cassie learns that Eliza may be her long-lost daughter after hearing about George Shelby's residence. In order to visit George and Eliza, Cassie and Emmeline fly to Montreal. Eliza recently had her second kid, and George is a machinist. After a heartfelt reunion, the Dutu family is offered a piece of their riches by Madame Dutu. A few years later, they return to the United States, this time in France. Liberia, a West African republic established by the United States government to house freed slaves, continues to be the focus of George's efforts to abolish slavery. It is in Liberia that the Georges, Eliza, and their families settle. Upon his return, George Harris informs Chloe of the tragic news of her husband's death. After that, he sets his slaves free. Their request is granted and they are told they would be paid salary and be released when he dies. He tells them of Uncle Tom's death and begs them to remember their independence whenever they see Tom's cabin. An earnest call to both the North and the South to eliminate slavery in the name of Christ is made in the epilogue's final paragraph. The protagonist of the narrative is Uncle Tom. While working as a slave in the 1850s, an elderly man who has no idea if he will be treated well by his new masters. According to his portrayal in the film, his gentler superiors have complete faith in Tom's ability to handle sensitive matters such as money and property. Tom was regarded heroic at the time of the book's publication because of these characteristics. Since its introduction about 200 years ago, opinions on Tom's character have evolved. Tom's indifference and acceptance of his circumstances since the American civil rights movement of the 1960s has grown inexplicable to many. To 20th century readers, Tom's apathy and acceptance of his circumstances has grown unfathomable since the American civil rights movement of the 1960s. Tom's persona in the story now appears to be a relic of the bygone era. When it comes to the word Uncle Tom, it's used as an insult to describe an old black guy who is only interested in serving his masters and is content to accept his status as a subordinate. Despite the fact that this generalization is occasionally accurate, it does not take into account the reason for Tom's apathy, his deep religious convictions. Christian beliefs are the driving force behind his character, they motivate him to accept his situation and persevere through his hardships with grace. While traveling across the novel, Tom spreads a message of peace and harmony with God to everyone he meets along the route. With his unselfish acceptance of pain and his mission to preach the Christian faith as widely as possible, 
he resembles Christ more and more. When he refuses to lash the slave girl after Legree instructs him to, Tom does not intentionally strive to defy his masters, but he does resist them when they provide commands that conflict with his personal values or sense of fairness. Tom's harsh employers, Stowe argues, would profit from his selfless Christian love, and slavery might be abolished if they did. In this approach, she portrays Tom as a role model for people of all races, not simply those of African descent. Eliza Harris, a young mother who escapes Mr. Shelby's plantation when she hears that he is intending to sell her kid, Harry to another owner. It was related to Stowe's husband Calvin that a slave woman escaped across the freezing Ohio River while carrying her infant in her arms. Eliza's character was based on this event. The novel's most memorable scene was based on this one. Eliza is yet another courageous and religious character in the tale. In order to save her child from a cruel owner, she puts herself in harm's way. As a kid, Stowe lost one of her own children, and she was inspired to write about Eliza's character as a result. Stowe realized how difficult it would be for a slave woman to lose a child due to human interference after losing her own child in the process. Stowe aimed to encourage white moms to join the abolitionist struggle by painting an image of a protective mother that transcends race. Eliza and Tom's master, Mr. Shelby, has a son named George Shelby. Georgie is a little child who is infatuated with Tom and spends a great deal of time in his cabin learning to read and write from him. As a child, George was heartbroken when his father sold Tom and promised to rescue him when he was an adult. The bulk of the narrative is spent away from the main action, with George reappearing as a grown man only to indicate how much time has gone and to fulfill his pledge to save Tom. After several years and countless sales of the man, he finally manages to hunt Tom down across the country. It is possible that Tom's influence has helped George become a noble young man who cares deeply for his inherited slave's well-being. When he frees all of his slaves following Tom's death, this issue is brought to reality. But the slaves are determined to stay at the Shelby property because of George's kindness and compassion. After promising to start paying and keeping the workers as staff rather than slaves, George agrees to this. At the book's conclusion, Simon Legree, the book's slave owner, murders Tom. His slaves are vicious to each other, and Legree has two slave women as his unwilling mistresses. To counter Tom's good nature, Legree is the story's most well-known villain and the primary antagonist. Throughout the book, Legree is frequently shown in close proximity to flames and other signs of a flaming demon. There is little character development or in-depth investigation of Legree's behavior. It is revealed that he had an extremely close bond with his mother whom he regarded angelic. The portrayal of Legree's character as the embodiment of the worst aspects of slavery is quite powerful. To do so, he brutally beats Tom to death, but in the end, he loses since Tom dies a Christian, forgiving those who killed him and his family. Eva St. Clair, Tom's second master's daughter in the novel. As their ship makes its way down the Mississippi, Eva and Tom become fast friends over their shared faith in Christ. Eva tells Tom that she intends to persuade her father to buy him so that he can avoid an uncertain future with Mr. Haley, and then she fulfills her own prophecy after falling off the ship by accident. Eva follows through on her promise to buy Tom from her father after he saved her life, and her father agrees. A lot of people refer to Eva as angelic since she's so sweet and kind. She treats everyone she comes into contact with, not only the slaves on her father's plantation. When Eva dies, it's like it happened only a moment ago. On her deathbed, she insists that her father liberate his slaves as soon as possible, doing everything she can to further the abolitionist cause. Even though she is a youngster, she is not terrified of her death and seems to be delighted to be joining her God in heaven. Biography of Harriet Beecher Stowe Author and abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote one of the most powerful novels of its sort in American literature, Uncle Tom's Cabin. As a young child, Roxana Beecher Beecher perished in an accident in Litchfield, Connecticut. Her father, a liberal minister called Lyman Beecher, gave birth to her on June 14, 1811. After graduating from Hartford Female Seminary, Harriet became one of the first women in her family to attend college. After her father was elected president of Lane Theological Seminary, Harriet relocated to Cincinnati, Ohio at the age of 21 to attend the seminary. During her time in Ohio, Harriet was a part of a literary salon that featured Emily Blackwell, the country's third female doctor. Another member of the club was Reverend Calvin Ellis Stowe, an ardent opponent of slavery whom Harriet later married in 1836. Among the descendants of the Pilgrims, she published her first book, The Mayflower, in 1843. She penned Uncle Tom's Cabin while residing in Brunswick, Maine, 
and it was a powerful condemnation of slavery. In 1852, it was published as a book after being serialized in an anti-slavery newspaper, The National Era. First Harriet published A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin the next year, which was an outstanding collection of evidence in support of her attack on slavery, which was an immediate success. The magazine Hearth and Home, one of the first aimed primarily at women, was founded by Harriet Beecher Stowe after the American Civil War. In 1896, at the age of 85, Harriet Beecher Stowe passed away. A historic cemetery in Andover, Massachusetts, was the final resting place for her. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Music